people. And it's, it's still to this day, probably my favorite lifting moment. It's just surreal. I'm obviously a huge fan of the uh, 45 degree barbell back raises, also known as the back extensions. I like to deadlift once a week, and I feel that is the optimal range for recovery. So I want to kick things off talking about deadlifting. Going back to 2016, when Nick Wright flew in from Rhode Island to film your infamous 920 pound deadlift. Do you have any lasting memories from that experience? Yeah, that was probably the most, you know, vivid deadlift experience I've had as far as over the years. The most significant lift I feel like I've had during the course of my career. So that one really stands out. Um, and what I remember about that day was, you know, we had planned it obviously like a month in advance. He told me he was going to come out and if if I wanted to hit something bigger that day. And everything just clicked that day. Everything came together. It was one of those days where I was just feeling completely dialed in. Everything was on. And uh, I kind of went into the day. I was like, all right, 920 would be a good number. That'd be like a huge PR. I'm curious to see if I can hit that. And even all the way up on the warm-ups, they felt amazing. Um, and after I pulled it, I even remember like, wow, I maybe should have tried 930. But it was getting to a point where it was before calibrated plates were a thing a whole lot. I had a couple of them on there, but we didn't have enough. So the bar was completely full and there wasn't much more room. So you're kind of weighing out like how much can I fit on the bar without it falling off? And uh, even with bands wrapped around it. So that was one of the things. But I, I always wonder to this day, I'm like, I wonder if I had 930 in me. Um, but really cool experience. Nick was awesome. Uh, it, you know, it drew a lot of people to my channel. It, it really got me out there even more. So that was really cool. And it's, it's still to this day, probably my favorite lifting moment. It's just surreal. What were you listening to while it was going on? Oh, I want to say back then it was Jedi mind tricks. Um, and I think it was, the song was called the God Supreme. Uh, that's what was going on in my earbuds, but. I definitely uh, listen to more toned down stuff nowadays. It's not so hardcore, so to speak, a little more dialed back. For sure. So you said that kind of went up, not easy, but you wondered if you had more in the tank. So was that the tougher lift to do or, you know, when you did like a 770 pound squat? Yeah, the squat was by far a tougher lift because squat has never come natural to me. And on that, squat attempt the 772 i hadn't really trained squats very much at all leading into that competition i had done pre predominantly deadlifts i squatted a heavy single maybe two occasions in like a 12 week span and that was it so really no quad dominant volume or anything on squats and uh, i went into it and my legs almost buckled on the walkout so i actually walked it out before that lift before the lift that was successful I unracked the bar and walked it out and my legs were like giving, like they were kind of like giving out. And so I was stumbling around and they had me walk it back in because if you don't start your descent, you're allowed to like re-rack in and set up again. Okay. Um, so I re-racked it, set up again. By this time, I'm kind of exhausted from unracking the bar and trying to hold that weight on my back. But I managed to stabilize and then I kind of, I hit depth really well and it, uh, I remember I didn't have it quite in the right bar placement on my back, so it rolled up my back a little, and I almost folded over completely and just basically had to, like, use my back, my entire low back to get the weight up. It was almost more, you know, low back dominant than quads, and uh, that, that lift about killed me, but that taught me a lesson, like, maybe you should train legs going into the meet <laughs> and not, not just rely on deadlifts, right? So that one was like a the toughest lift I probably ever hit, but the deadlift, the 920 was the most significant. And it was just so smooth where, um, you know, people would ask, how does that feel at those weights? And it doesn't feel that much different than um, maybe what, what you would be hitting for a max, how that would feel or anybody else. Yeah. It's all relative, right? So it just felt smooth. I mean, I felt like it popped off the floor very, very quickly. And then I'm pretty confident. Yeah. Like 10 more pounds would have been there. Awesome. So I want to stick on deadlifts. So what are your best tips for an intermediate lifter who wants to improve their deadlift, both from a one rep max standpoint, but also, you know, 
for reps as well in a higher rep range. Oh yeah. So that's exactly how I train it. I don't necessarily train for high reps, but the way I train it, it definitely um, carries over to that. So everything I'm doing, I'm training for my one rep max to go up, but there's also a huge carryover to reps and I do rep work pretty significantly. So I like to deadlift once a week and I feel that is the optimal range for recovery. So a lot of people um, push a higher frequency, but as far as low back health, because the first, the first thing that's going to be your bottleneck is your low back may get injured. You may have low back pain. So we get around that, but we, we take deadlift once a week. That's what I do now. And that seems to be a good amount of time to recover. And it also allows it. So where you can go completely 100% on those given days, you don't have to hold back. You feel like, you know, this is your one shot at it within a seven day span. So you're going to really attack it to your best ability. And I do a couple different, you know, weeks I'll do like one week where it's higher rep and that's kind of what you're talking about. So this might be lighter weight, but higher rep. And then I'll do another week where I have like an AMRAP in there um, and I'll wear just max reps. So that one, you know, last time I hit 16 reps, for instance, on my last week of that. And then I'll have another week where it's like a heavier week of low reps. So I kind of rotate rep ranges and things like that. And that way you're getting all the best of, you know, both worlds. You're getting the endurance, the higher reps, and you're getting the, the maximal strength on the top end with the lower reps. And this translates extremely well. But I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is maybe going with too high of a frequency on the deadlift. Just keep it to once a week. Give yourself that time to be fresh and recovered, especially in your low back going into the next day. Okay. And then how many sets are you doing of deadlifts? And then like, what would you recommend in terms of accessory work to improve your deadlift as well? So I will do anywhere from three to four sets on a given day of deadlift. As far as the working sets, I'll do a couple reps um, warming up. So that way, like obviously we'll take jumps leading up to the working sets, but three or four working sets. And then I am obviously a huge fan of the uh, 45 degree barbell back raises, also known as the back extensions. And that's where you take a 45 degree um, hyper setup in a gym where it's like this. And a lot of people just do this body weight. But a long time ago, I saw somebody doing it with a barbell. This was probably 15 years ago. And they would deadlift the barbell off the floor basically to overload the movement. So I started doing those and the benefit to my deadlift was profound. It was, uh, resulted in so much more speed and strength off the floor as far as getting the bar moving. So I became much faster and really strengthens the hamstrings, the low, the low back and the glutes, the entire posterior chain. And then another one I'm really fond of as of late are good mornings. So good mornings are very low back dominant. Um, they can be somewhat of a intimidating lift because you're, you're completely, you know, hunched over and it doesn't look like something that would be too good for your low back. But this has also really helped my deadlift and my squat, um, predominantly low back. You get some upper back work in there and then you get a little bit of hamstring. And those are the two right now that I'm really pushing and have seen significant progress with. And those are the ones I would recommend. It's, it takes a little bit of a learning curve, especially with good mornings, but they pay off. So it seems like you think that like doing hamstrings for accessory work is beneficial to the deadlift. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, so you also have glute ham raises. You have Nordic hamstring curls. Um, I prefer the lying prone version of the hamstring curl machine if you're going to do that one, but they're all going to be good. Uh, hamstrings are a huge weakness for a lot of people to where it slows them down off the floor. They're So you'll see people who are slower off the floor on deadlift. They're just not getting that explosive power. And that can often be from a weak low back and weak hamstrings. So I do like to target the hamstrings um, a couple days a week. Okay. So the deadlifting you'll do once a week, but these access accessory movements that we talked about, those you might do with more frequency. Yeah, I would say two days a week total for your deadlift squat accessories um, is optimal. You still want to have enough recovery time. So I used to go with a bit higher frequency and now I think two days is about adequate because really the bottleneck for a lot of people are back issues and you have to be, you know, you have to be ready for that. So another thing I do core core work every single day, every single wow. day. Um, that's one thing I overlooked for much of my career and it led to back issues. But when I stay on top of the core work in the form of the McGill big three, 
um, weighted planks and ab wheel. Those are the most significant ones I do. And also I should single arm farmer carries. So single arm, also known as suitcase farmer carries are essential for uh, QL health, the quadratus lumborum and the low back. Um, cause that's often the bottleneck as well for why people get back pain and can't train around it. So that has been a game changer ever since I added that in because the, at the end of the day, you have to figure out how to stay healthy. That's the key. Okay. So it sounds like you obviously are happy with your results in the past, like your max deadlift of 920, but there would be some things that you would do slightly different now based on your experience. 110%. I mean, I would do everything different. <laughs> it, it's crazy. No, for real. There's. It's, it's almost crazy because like, the result was already so impressive that you would do things, you know, so differently. I, I, I kid you not. I would do everything 100% different from what I did. Because the thing about it is youth, you're 20, you're in your 20s, you're on anabolic steroids, you're relying on these factors of just not having injuries because you're, you're young, and then the anabolics, and then, you know, obviously genetics play somewhat of a role, but you're relying on all these things to push the envelope and you're mm -hmm. skipping all the things that could push you over the top. The things that I have to do now I've been drug free for three and a half years yeah. and I can't get away with doing things like that. I've had a lot of back pain since 2017. So once these things started to creep in, I can't get away with the simplistic methods of before or just like, Oh, I'm going to see how I feel today and go heavy and skipping warm ups and skipping core work. And you can't do that anymore. So I learned a lot over the years of like what I have to do now to be able to progress. But I'm like, man, if I had implemented this kind of structure to things back then, like there's no telling and you can't second guess it, but you learn from it now. Yeah. It sounds like, you know, fatigue management, you realize is pretty important now and you probably weren't really plateauing then because of the anabolics um, and just the increased recovery. So those are things that, you know, three and a half years since taking anything you're, coming to the reality of like how to manage those things. Correct. It's just the way I train, the way I recover, the way I eat now, the way I warm up, it's all a complete 180 from what it was. That's the, and it's, it's crazy, but you know, you have to remember like, it's the same way in business. Maybe what got you to a certain spot will not get you to the next spot. Yeah. You have to be willing to change it. So I was very frustrated for many years, especially since coming off the testosterone and the anabolic steroids to where I'm like, how the heck do I progress now? And I had to think about every little detail and I had to, I had to change it. And so that's what I've been doing now with great success. But it took so many years of just like trial and error and like figuring these things out and uh, putting in the necessary time on the boring stuff to where now I'm seeing the payoff. But I never did any of that stuff in my 20s because I didn't need to because you're you're masking it all with the progression of anabolics. Like it's just everything blows up. You can get away with all these mistakes. You can eat whatever you want. You can train in a very um, non-structured manner. You can just rely on your youth. There's no injuries. That sort of stuff saved me back then. Awesome. What are you deadlifting now? Oh, cool. Okay. So I had uh, tried a 100-mile race. That's just, that's another story. That was on June fourteenth, and mm -hmm. I hadn't been lifting much until then. So I got off the race. I deadlifted five oh two to see where I was at. That was about six weeks ago. So okay. six weeks ago, I did a five oh two deadlift just to see it as a starting point. Truthfully, now six weeks later, I haven't tested it yet. I would be ninety percent confident I could pull six hundred. Okay. Um, and I'd like to push that a lot higher because here's, here's my target. Now it's like my best deadlift on testosterone only. So 250 milligrams a week of testosterone. My best ever was 760 at 220 body weight. And I kind of have that in my crosshairs with no testosterone. I'm like, I wonder if we can do it. So that'd be cool. That'd be a cool like goal right now. I weigh 210 pounds. Um, and like during the race, even six weeks ago, I was 196.5. So I've put yeah. on, you know, a significant weight, but it's, it's coming up rapidly again, now that I'm really pushing training. Cool. So I'm going to switch context here. So, uh, people may not know this, but you are an OG follower of David Goggins since the day of your first marathon when you were around 15 years old. So way before he was mainstream, 
Um, what did you learn about mindset from him and how did you apply it to powerlifting and life in general? I think in some ways it was a, a bad thing. In some ways it was a good thing, his mindset, because back then when he was not well known, um, 2009, actually. So 2009, I believe I was at that point dating myself, uh, 19, maybe. Um, I attempted, maybe I was 17. I can't, no, I was 17. I, I attempted a 50 mile ultra and I had known about guys <laughs> and I was like, okay, this guy's really muscular. He looks amazing. And I knew about his story with his first like track run where he did the hundred miles around the track and he was 240 pounds and he like, didn't train and like, I don't know, he didn't train at all and he did it. So I kind of was like, I'll be fine. I'm not really going to train. I'm going to try this thing. And my longest run was like 10 miles before that race. And so I tried the 50 miler and I only made it to 25 before I got pulled because I, I, I couldn't meet the cutoff time. And that was like that cocky, like, I'm just going to do like Goggins, not really train thing. That was all the way to 20, 2009. So that, that kind of came back to bite me then. Um, but then over the years, just like reading his books and um, listening to all his videos and stuff that really, I don't know, it like motivated me because it's just such a crazy story. Everything he's done is crazy. His whole entire life story, his training, all of it is insane. So I just really am motivated by him. And then I met him in 2019 in Nashville. Um, a client of mine, he, he does speaking, he does like TED Talks and he was at the same one Goggins was going to be at. So he's like, all right, I'm going to come, you know, I'm going to bring you over there. And I got to meet him and that was really a surreal moment. So, uh, everything kind of came full circle at that point, but he's an awesome guy. Is that where you got that, uh, photo that I've seen in some of your videos? Yes, sir. Yeah, that was, it was crazy to meet him. I just never thought it's been five years now. Wild to think, but he was living in Nashville for a while. I don't know if he still is. He might've went back to California, but um man that guy has definitely motivated me over the years as a lot of people awesome so what i'm gonna do now is i'm gonna throw out some quotes and things you've said in the past just give me your first uh first thought or first take on it uh so we kind of talked about this but the first one here is i think a lot of injury management is volume management yes i definitely think that's a huge part of it and that goes back to what we talked about with okay, we're going to deadlift once a week instead of three times a week. Uh, there's a lot of things you can get away with when you're 20, when you're 25, maybe even when you're 30. Um, you have to change the way you train and think as far as recovery and longevity. So I do think that's 100% a thing. You, it has to be very structured training to get the optimal results. All right. Next one here. You cannot lift big weights with fear. You have to get rid of it. Yes, I would pretty much agree with that. When you're in the moment of about to hit a heavy lift, whether it's especially on squat, that's the one that's going to scare you the most because I've seen a lot of things go wrong. I've seen some terrible injuries on squat that, that changed people's careers like they were never the same. Um, you just can't, you have to go into it, like turn the brain off and, and channel the adrenaline. So that's a hundred percent a thing. I never was fearful on like a bench because I wasn't really lifting enough. I feel like, um, and deadlift, I'm not, you're not fearful because there's not really anything terrible that can happen, but squat is intimidating when it gets heavy and you're balancing this weight on your back. Like I've seen quads rupture and patella tendons go right in front of me. And it's just like, gruesome injuries so that one you do have to kind of shut the brain off and, and lean into it um because and i was never really the same after like there was a 783 squat attempt the year after the 772 and uh i remember going down to the bottom with it and my quad popped and i tore the quad and that kind of freaked me out after that for a long time where i didn't really have the excitement to get under a heavy squat. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's difficult. Like those things can mess with you, but you do somewhat have to uh, turn that off. And I would say the way I train now, I'm not fearful of like, Oh, can I hit this weight? It's like, you should be training in a manner where you know, you can hit the weights, but maybe in a meet, it's like, all right, we're pushing it a little bit. 
we don't know how this is going to go. And that's where you have to be dialed in, which most people are at that point with the adrenaline going. Okay. So it sounds like, you know, being prepared helps, but then there's just the reality of like when you're pushing yourself that you have to just turn that off and figure out how to turn it off. Yes, sir. And I will say those extreme injuries don't really happen in drug free lifters. I can't even think of the last one I saw where somebody was um, not on anabolic steroids and had something terrible happen. Like it's Why not really that is because you're, you're within the confines of what the body can actually handle. Like you're progressing at a rate that the body can keep up with the tendons and all that. But when you're on anabolics, you're pushing so quickly that oftentimes the body can't keep up. So you'll see the major catastrophic injuries happen to people on that stuff. Whereas people not on that stuff, it just isn't there. Like you might have some minor tweaks and such, but nothing where it's like, oh, I, that guy blew out his quad tendon. Like it's not a thing. All right. Uh, so this next one, uh, when I read it, it resonated quite a bit with me. Um, it's if you only see your parents once a year, it's not that you have 20 years with your parents. You have 20 more times with them. Yeah, that's. That is the reality of the situation. And this kind of hit me around the COVID time because you're, you know, we're not, we weren't visiting people, right? So there was a point where I hadn't seen them in like a year and a half. And I was just like, what am I doing? Um, and that was a tough pill to swallow because they lived in Wisconsin and I was in Tennessee, obviously. As they've since moved here as of like a year ago. So I see them all the time. But that was that was a tough one. That's like being what we talked about, being around family. Like that's often why we live where we live. You want to be around family. You don't want to be um, cross country. And the, the one tricky thing with this is like my sister, she is in she is kind of cross country. She's in Colorado. So when I see her, when we were visiting there, she's visiting here. I try to, you know, realize that that epiphany and spend time with her because you just don't know. You don't know how many years we've got. We don't know how many years our family members have. We don't know what's going to happen. So it's just one of those things where often I would get so dialed into a goal. If there's like a major goal, I get so dialed into that, that I would often lose sight of like the simple things around me where it's like, don't speed up time. Don't speed up your life. Like you've got, I, I know we all have major goals, but enjoy the present moment because I would often be thinking six months ahead of the end goal. And then that six months flies by. And this kind of hit me with the ultra the hundred mile race training. It's like, you know, I, I was gone quite a bit, obviously on like long runs, but I just, I want to be around. I want to be present in the day to day rather than being like, okay, I'm only thinking about the next goal. Cause a lot of us are goal driven to where we're thinking about that next goal and we can't get completely swept up in it. Yeah. I, I completely agree. I have the challenge that I live in the future too much, like in my brain where I'm kind of, I'm very goal oriented. So there's times where, you know, I am meeting with friends and family and I'm already kind of thinking ahead instead of being present in the moment. Um, so that kind of quote just made me think in terms of like, okay, if you don't know how many times you're going to see whoever it may be, a friend or a family member, like you got to make sure that's as quality time as possible. Yeah, it sounds like we have the exact same mindset. I'll be like thinking ahead all the time. Oh, I can't wait to do this or do that. And sometimes you just have to take a step back, let life slow down and be like, all right, let's enjoy this time right here, this day, um, instead of always looking ahead, because that's that's what happens. We're always looking ahead to the next day, the next week, next month. And I was I'm caught in this cycle endless times. So the only way I can combat it is just to be aware of it. And that's hard to do in your day to day. You get caught up in things. So you're not always aware of it. But the more aware you are of it, that's the only way you can fight it. For sure. All right. The next one here is you get what you focus on and your thoughts become your reality. I'm starting to realize the power of one's own mind. Yeah, that's only at certain times have I been in that mindset. There's been times where I've lost that mindset. I think it's a good mindset, but there's times where it's left me, where I felt like I'm wandering through life, um, not really sure where I'm going. And I think we all get to those points. But when I've been in that almost honed in, zoned in, whatever you want to call it, mindset, 
I've had great success. It's like, it's just, you can achieve a lot of things when you focus on that and you believe it. So it's something that's been tricky at times for me to get back into, but it works. It's, and it's hard to, hard to put into words. It's just like this, this train of thought of confidence and knowing that the plan will succeed if you stick to the plan with whatever you're doing, that belief, and it becomes your reality. So it's just like laying the foundation day to day and it adds up over time. But this is also where you have that um, paradigm of like, I'd also don't want to just miss out on what's in front of me. So it's, it's dangerous, but it's good. And this is, that's the tricky thing. It's like, you're always trying to balance success with being present and enjoying what you have now. Um, and that's the tricky part. Like we all want to look ahead to what could be and what will be, but then we're also like, we got to live present. So it's hard. It's like this thing that conflicts. Yeah, it's definitely hard. No question that it's hard there, right? Because you can be goal oriented. You could say, you know, I'm, I'm locked in. I know I'm moving to the right direction, but then you also want to be grateful for what you have today. And it's a skill. And I think there's certain times where it's clicking for me. And then there are certain times where I feel lost as well. And certain times, maybe you try to force a goal that's not the right goal because you need a goal. And then you realize, like, I was kind of forcing that goal. And that's why it wasn't clicking. I mean, that's been my experience where it's like, I need the next thing. So I kind of force the next thing in instead of just being patient and waiting for it to come to me. Oh, I can relate to that where there's not you're, you you need something to strive for. So you're like just trying to figure something out. Um, something that was interesting that I saw Chris Williamson talking about one time was he said that a lot of times basically the gist of it was the life we're seeking is essentially the life we have now. Like we're, we're seeking this vision of like, oh, I'll have all this free time to do these things I want to do. And uh, if I work really hard, I can have that in 20, 30 years or whatever. And in reality, it's like you could have that right now. Uh, maybe not all the money or, and such, but you might have the opportunity to do that already. So you're trying to buy your freedom, but the freedom could be there presently. And I was like, my mind was blown. Um, that one hit a little. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's that's deep. So it's it's tough. Like when you're motivated, you want to you want to push for things, but you also have to be introspective at times about what am I actually striving for what's the what's the end goal with this for sure all right i'm going to move into more fun and fitness way a little bit less deep here so you've mentioned that you're a compound zealot and it was something that you were wrong about so tell me what's your mount rushmore your current four favorite isolation movements and why yeah i used to be nothing but compound lifts at my own peril and uh, now tons of isolation work i think it's essential and especially if you want to transform your physique, you need a ton of isolation movements. So that's been the game changer for me. But I would say, number one, I just really like tricep pushdowns on the cable. Like, yeah, with the with the the V handle, that's yeah. my key. That's the handle I like to use. And those have been such a great exercise as far as like a, a bench accessory for strength and just incredible size arm pump. I love those. And then along the same token, I would have to put in there um, cable curls with the V handle. So it's, it's almost puts your, your, your grip in this position at 45 degrees, 30 degrees roughly. And it just feels so much better to me than the straight bar on, on cable curls. And I love that. I did both of those today. So that's, that's kind of funny, but those two have been huge. I really love cable work in general. Now I would have to say two other ones. It's tricky because almost all the lower body work I do is compound, whereas a lot of the upper body is isolation. Um, so those two. And then I really like the uh, the overhead cable tricep extensions. So that's where you're like facing away from the cable. You've got your arms overhead and you're extending your arms out like this with your elbows flared. That one is also a great tricep accessory. Um, and I do. I really I wish we had one. The uh, reverse pec 
peck deck or peck fly machine. I love that. Nothing better for hitting the rear delts. We don't have one, but that movement is amazing. I do like the peck fly as well, but I would say push downs, overhead tricep extensions with the cable, um, close grip cable curls with the V handle, and then the, the reverse peck fly. Those would be my four like isolation movements that would completely transform your physique if I had to come up with four. Awesome. Yeah. So what's interesting is for the tricep push down for the longest time I was using the rope and I actually recently switched to the V handle because I found that uh, each rep was more consistent from a range of motion because sometimes with the rope, it's like I'm holding it in. Sometimes I'm holding it out. Yep. And although I liked it, it's just, I felt there was less consistency um, with the, the V bars. I know, wow. you know, kind of what the beginning and the end of every rep is. Um, for the overhead, I still like the rope. It just feels better. Um, and then for the cables, have you tried starting your arm behind your back with it? With, with like one arm? Yeah, with one arm. Because then it's kind of in that lengthened position. And uh, it's it's a pretty good exercise. I've tried it a few times. And I'm always like, my biceps really sore after this. Um, so that's actually really good. So yeah, starting your hand kind of behind and then curling to like here. Um, it's a really good exercise as well with cables. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Those are good. I really do like those and those will be up there. But I, I just prefer the like two handed B bar. Um, and I'm in the same way with the overhead extensions. I use the rope as well. So we're pretty much on the same token there. I think the cable thing, it's it's similar to like where you're doing the incline uh, seated cable curl or dumbbell curls because exactly. you're kind of at that back angle so those have been nice but no i work them all in like i love hitting biceps <laughs> <laughs> i guess you just did years of doing such heavy lifts you're like i like working the arms now it's kind of fun oh, i love it and it's so much more relaxing and like you don't have to get amped up you know i i mean i guess for you i i still get amped up but you you don't need to have the same uh level of rage that you had back in the day doing deadlifts <laughs> no i lift with zero rage now i i lift well in a calm and happy state so i never really get amped up at all on anything anymore i'm very calculated and just like you know in a meet i would try to get the adrenaline up i would get excited but the rage thing was more a anabolic steroid youthful um youthful thing i don't know if i could tap into that now because i had it when i was uh even pre-anabolics but that was like teenage angst type feelings of like not fitting in so you just worked up but i don't have rage anymore it's just not present ever so it's like i couldn't get mad if i tried like before a deadlift or squat um i can get a little like okay i'm kind of psyched up but not not anywhere like that i lift terrible if i'm angry like if i were to be angry i'd lift awful uh you have to be like in a calm happy state and then I lift well. I don't, it's flipped. Okay. No, that makes sense. I wonder if you feel that you could have been as successful in the past without the rage. Like, was that a requirement at that time in your twenties? Yeah, it was, it was all genuine, but <laughs> it's one of those situations where it's like, okay, you may have this benefit in the gym. But outside of the gym, it completely works against you. You are a loose cannon. You're a hothead. You have all these temper temper issues. So it leads to um, poor relationships and poor foundations and all this turmoil. And, and you're always depressed and you're always angry. And like it wasn't good outside of the gym. It's a cool. It, sure. It looks not. It looks fun on camera. And I'll, I'll be clear. It was not an act whatsoever. None of it. Um but it also spills over to your personal life and that's problematic. You can't be walking around that, that worked up all the time, which is one of the issues with trend with trend alone. You're worked up constantly. There's 24 seven. You're worked up. There's no dialing down. Um, and I, people will, sometimes you get these skeptics who are like, well, you're just exaggerating how bad it is. I felt fine. My buddy was fine. I'm like, people who take trend alone are not fine. I've, I've seen it many times. It's, and and there, I do I like everybody who's fairly calm on it, but even he says he feels completely different on it. Um, so it, it's and that I have to say too, like I said, even before any of that stuff, when I was just 
training in my basement pre anabolics, like I would get worked up. And it was the, the chip on my shoulder feeling of me against the world, not successful with women at that point and things like that. So you have this feeling of, uh, you're a loner. There's no, you don't have friends and, and that sort of thing. So that fueled it as well. But when you get to a place in life where you're fairly stable, life is fairly good. It's hard to do that. Yeah. I wonder if that relates to how you said, like as life, you know, as you kind of grow up and life changes, your approach needs to change. So sometimes I'll look back in my twenties and say, I would do it differently, but I actually wonder if that was the right approach. Right. So it's like maybe you had to have that approach in your 20s for what you did, but it's it's not the right way to do things now, you know, because it's easy to look now and say, oh, I would have done everything differently. But sometimes I wonder, like, OK, if I did, would I be as successful? That's very true. We can't second guess it because we're, we're where we are in life for a reason. It played out the way it did for a reason. But if I had the knowledge I had now. I undoubtedly would have done everything different, but then I maybe wouldn't be where I'm today. So it's tricky. Yeah. Cause I hear a lot of like, uh, that just kind of going the business world, like hyper successful business people now will say like, the first thing you need to do is work out and get in shape and you'll feel more productive. I was my most productive when I was not in shape and not eating well. Cause I was just locked in on that one goal. But it's easy for me to say now, like, you need to get in shape, you need to do that first. But I think if I spent my time doing that, I would actually be less successful. So I know that's kind of counter to what you'll hear on social media, because like, oh, just get your, your health in check, and you'll be more productive. I'm like, I was most locked in when I didn't care about anything, but sales, growing my business, etc. Like that's when I was 100% locked in, and I let everything else uh, to the side, would it be health, even somewhat relationships, etc. That's what drove that forward. So it's hard. It is hard to kind of second guess yourself there. And yeah, I relate to that. That's how I was. I was a hundred percent. Nothing mattered, but getting stronger. So not the healthiest mindset, but productive in that arena. Exactly. All right. So some of your old videos involved the diet of pumpkin spice Oreos ice cream, fried chicken, and a whole lot of mac and cheese. So can you talk about how your diet has changed and, and how you view the importance of diet now? <laughs> oh, man. Yes. I mean, again, we go back to the 20s. You are invincible feeling. Health is whatever. And you get to your 30s and you start feeling mortal and you have responsibilities and family and you want to live and not have a heart attack. So I... uh Quite actually fairly recently, and not that I was eating awful before, but like it wasn't like that. That was, that was my 20s. That truly was my entire 20s was like that. Very little protein, lots of junk food, processed food. That was the only thing I would eat. Um, and I, I made quite good results off that because it was just calories in and you're on anabolics and you can do that. Uh, now, you know, per, fairly recently, I'm getting tons of protein, way more. Uh, every day, it's, it's a pound of ground beef. Uh, rice and four whole eggs, a Greek yogurt, protein bar, protein shake, um, cottage cheese with berries. And that's pretty much the staple of the diet. And then maybe I'll throw in a little extra stuff um, on the side. But that's really that gets me above 200 grams of protein or about 215, I want to say, which is wow. I'm, I'm 210 pounds now. So pretty much one gram per pound of body weight. And that's a high saturated fat diet. So that tricky thing here. I'm trying to have my hormone levels be, be good and saturated fat helps with that um, when you're drug free because you can't rely on synthetic testosterone to keep your levels up. So you're you're trying to get proper protein and saturated fat and cholesterol and all that dietary. But the tricky thing is we know saturated fat is what raises LDL and I, I don't want that to get completely out of hand given my genetic history. But at the same time, lipoprotein little a, which is even more of a concern, one in five people have a very elevated level. I'm one of them. Uh, my level is insanely high, 260 nmol per liter, and uh, it should be like below 40. So that that goes down the more saturated fat you eat. Now, I haven't tested that that LP little a thing, and I've tested like four or five times over the years. It's always sky high, and it's genetic, and I haven't tested it since I've been doing the high saturated fat. So I do want to test that and see on this 
high saturated fat diet if it lowers it. Um, but at the same time, you're going to raise your LDL. So it's like pick your poison to an extent. I'm going to get an angiogram done to see the plaque build up in my heart, all that kind of stuff. But um, the diet is much less processed, much cleaner, much higher protein. But there is this high amount of saturated fat. So I'm playing around with that aspect of things to see what will result in the best heart health long term because I'm trying to balance the LP little a and the LDL. And I'm going to see what the scan shows and, and pick my doctor, uh, Kyle Gillette, his mind about it. And we'll see. But but overall, the diet's much cleaner, much less processed, much higher protein. And the the thing about it that that won me over, the changes to my physique from getting this diet dialed into high quality sources of food has been similar to anabolic steroids. Like I never have eaten high protein. I've never eaten properly. And I saw such visual changes in a short amount of time and, and such, such massive changes to my strength levels that I was like, this is unbelievable. Like this is insane. And it seems obvious in hindsight, but I cannot believe how much, different how, how different my physique looks and how much stronger i've gotten since getting that dialed in so it's just one of those cards that like especially if you're drug free you have to get that dialed in there's no excuse not to if you want to maximize how you look and your strength you have to do this um and it, like i said the only thing that could be argued is the saturated fat intake we'll have to see uh i even added in crestor statin like twice a week to okay. bring the ldl down a little bit at 10 milligrams because I don't feel anything from Crestor. It's a milder statin, but it works really well. But the LP little a thing, most people do not have to worry about that. But I have to really, it, it's something I have to think about. For sure. I think for diet, it's important to understand that it's important, especially, you know, you're listening to this podcast, you care about lifting, but also figuring out what makes sense for you and what's sustainable. So I've, I'm guessing, uh, Compared to the people that I interview, I have a much more loose social life. Um, I drink a few times a month. I go out to eat quite a bit. So I'm kind of like 70% clean food and then 30% less clean food. And that seems to work for me where it fits my lifestyle. Um, it's generally good, but it's by no means perfect or optimized for for strength or visual changes. It's 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 kind of that sweet spot for me where I can still be loose and hang out with my friends in a way that I want to um, without feeling like I have to be perfect. And I get that. That's you have to balance everything in life. Like what is worth it from, from that standpoint. So your lifestyle is a bit different than mine as far as that goes. And that's why we are in different situations. You know, I'm, I eat the same thing pretty much every day now, but I'm, I'm very ritualistic. Like every day is very similar. There's not a lot of deviation. So I think that's one reason it works. Um, and at the present moment, I'm literally focused on just getting as strong as possible. And so whatever's going to help with that outside of anabolic steroids and testosterone, <laughs> outside, of, outside of going back down that rabbit hole, because I'm not willing to put my health at risk of course. in that fashion. Um, I want to get as strong as I can. Of course. So it's just a different thing. Of course. And, and you, you're an athlete. Like that's how I imagine you view yourself. So you're going to treat it in that manner. Um, when for someone like myself, like fitness is part of my life, but people wouldn't, people who know me in my real life, they don't know me as the fitness guy. It's just one piece of the puzzle, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Cool. So you were public about your PD use way before it was in fashion. And something I found interesting is you even split the money on a viral video with the client getting attacked. To me, this shows transparency and integrity. I'm curious, what do those two mean to you? I would say, especially in the last year or so, I've uh, definitely come closer to Christ. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm Christian and mm -hmm. my relationship evolved in a manner where I really looked at everything I'm doing through that lens of like, how can I be, how can I live how I want to, how I need to live to bring people to them. So that played a huge factor in things. And now this was many years ago when um, that video went viral, I want to say like 2017. Um, but even then there was a moral compass. We all have a moral compass to an extent. And mine was much 
more loose back then. But obviously, like, and neither one of us thought this video would go viral. I just put it up. I was like, all right, this is interesting. Um, so I, I put it up and it went insanely viral. It went like 15 million. And we were getting called left and right and everything. And I think the video made 10 grand off YouTube monetization, which a lot. Yeah, for YouTube, YouTube doesn't pay that much, like for real guys. And uh, never had anything close to that. But it was 15 million views. So what are you going to do? So we split it like five and five. And then YouTube like basically like completely blocked the video. It gets like no views anymore. I might have even taken it down um, at some point because it like sometimes they'll bury a video if it's I don't know. I don't know why. But anyway. The one thing I the one thing I feel honestly, I don't know. That video I'm kind of torn on too. There's there's one thing I've never really talked about, but like the guy clearly made a mistake. But I don't know the attention that video got that we never expected. I don't know what that did to the attacker guy's life. Mm. And we, okay, here's the thing about that. Like you say, yes, he was wrong. He she everybody. I don't like. I don't like the, what do we call it? The the group think where it's like the mob mentality of let's completely decimate a person over a mistake. And I don't know what happened with the guy. I I'm sure there was a fallout, but you know, whether or not he had death threats from that or whether or not he completely had to move, I don't, I don't even know, but it's just like that hasn't sat well with me okay. since this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Right. I've never yeah. talked about this. Like I've never mentioned this anywhere. I, I I think I took the video down, maybe, and that was part of it. And at this point, no one was viewing it anyway. And you could say, well, would that be different if it was making tons of money selling? You you know, you never know because that's human nature. But even like I said, we never planned for it to go viral. You think maybe it'll get five thousand views because that's what my videos were getting. Mm -hmm. We didn't know it was going to explode. It was a million in like eight hours. Like it was insane. Wow. And then it just went from there. But the problem with that is like, I don't know what damage did it to the other guys. And you're, and you're trying to be a positive influence, right? So, you know, I can, I would probably feel the same way in the back of my mind. Like, I wonder what happened to that guy. Like he, he might be, a, he might be a dick or he might've made a, one or two bad decisions in life. And now it's coming back to haunt him, right? Like to, to an extreme level at a scalable level when maybe it would be in his community. Now it's, it's worldwide. Yeah. And the other thing, here's, here's the other thing. Like it was a clear case of roid rage. Like I'm, I'm It's it, to me, it's obvious. Okay. I've had roid rage. It's roid rage is real. Am I any better? Like I didn't kick a bar out of a kid's hand or like, you know, do anything like that. But it's like, we've, we've had moments where we're not shining, but the, maybe they weren't. And it's, this, it's It ties into the principles of Christianity. It's like, we are all sinners. We all commit sins. No one is better than the other. We can't be Pharisees up here and be like, this guy did this, and we're looking down on people for it. So to me, I'm just like, I've had to think a lot about this, and it's like, I may not have done that, but I've done bad things. We've all yeah. done bad things. Would I have wanted my worst moment to be videotaped and put on the internet? Probably not. And I look at decisions and things I did on anabolics especially trend which i felt was the one thing that really gave me roid rage i'm just like you know i was a i was a doorman i was a bouncer like yeah. there, were, there were confrontations for real that may not have painted you in the best light for sure so it's like i don't know i just really don't that was one of those ones i thought about a lot and we kind of veered off here i know from the original question but like that was one of those moments that stood out to me about that whole thing. I think that comes back to the integrity part, the fact that you're spending time thinking about that and reflecting on that. I think it shows kind of the moral compass again that we were talking about. That you yeah. question it, that you even question it at this point. I, I've thought about it. I'm not going to I actually heard from um, Charles the other day. So he emailed me out of the blue about a week ago. The guy in the video. Not the guy who, who kicked the bottom. <laughs> That my client, um, he's doing well. He went down, he had he had some things happen. He went down a bad path, similar to like, and now he's on a good path, you know. So he's doing well. And I'm not gonna get into details, obviously, but mm -hmm. he's uh 
he's kind of he seems like he's in a really good place. So that's kind of what happened to him. And I gotta say now he's gotta be he's gonna be late twenties. Okay. So he's probably five, six years younger than me. Okay. So, cool. All right. I'm gonna move in a uh, much more fun direction here. So you have a podcast um, and you've interviewed a bunch of people. I'm going to throw their images on the screen and tell me if there's either something you learned from them or something that stuck out in your conversation with them. Gotcha. All right. First person is uh, Alex Bromley. Bromley, man. He is, we had conversations on the side, outside of the podcast even. And the guy, truth, he's a genius businessman. He is so smart when it comes to business and marketing. And those were my biggest takeaways from him. Like as much as, as he knows about strength and how knowledgeable he is, you look at where he started as far as his channel, for instance, where he is now. And he just, he never stopped putting in the work. So he was very consistent. He's, he's an absolute genius when it comes to business. And those were the main things that I really was like, wow, like this okay. guy took it took care of business in a professional manner and yeah. you've seen the success of him. So his growth has been incredible. And that, yeah. that's really the, the main points where I, I'm, I'm blown away. I spoke with him recently and I just felt he could cover a variety of topics at a very high intellectual capacity. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely you know, see that. It's crazy because Bromley may not be the strongest guy out there, but he's so smart that he, in a in, in a business sense and in how he applies himself and how he puts the work in, he's above everybody. But he just, it's, it's his numbers were never elite, but he's just like I'm so I'm so impressed by what he's done. Awesome. Next is Larry Wheels. Yeah, Larry was. Uh, I mean, you talk about another guy who's made it completely big. He blew up. To a level I couldn't have couldn't have imagined. I mean, we knew he was a freak. Like when he came out, it wasn't just his strength. Obviously, it was like how he looked, his physique. He was just a freak of nature, as far as in a good way. And I met him at one of the meets in Mountain View, actually. So Mountain View, I saw him, and a really down to earth guy. Like that's the true quality. You see it on camera when he's talking to people. He has him out. He's very down to earth. Um, but just a freakish level of explosiveness on his strength. Like he's so explosive. He's so fast. Everything he does with such speed. And that's what separated him. It was like pure fast twitch on every lift. Uh, but a really nice guy. He's always supported me. Like I have nothing bad to ever say about the guy. Awesome. Next one is Greg Doucette. Greg Doucette was a fascinating guy because when I actually sat down with him that, and that podcast I did with him got like no traction. Like, it was actually one of my worst performing podcasts, but I came away really, again, impressed with his business savvy. And it's different than Bromley. It's a completely different um, concept, a completely different system he uses as far as his business growth. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg's very like calculated in the sense like it is all an act. That's not really like how he is. Um but it works like he's more Greg. Greg's different in the sense where he's like, all right, I'm going to put a lot of stuff out. That's going to draw tons of negative attention to me, but any attention is good attention. And we've seen that work with guys like Conor McGregor in the UFC yeah. or Colby Covington. And it's a very similar overlap. Like Greg's like going to be as controversial as possible. And it's going to grow his brand immensely. I personally, I couldn't do that. Like I, I just mm -hmm. can't, I can't, I can't do it. I'm more of like the Bromley style, but it worked. And the one thing about Greg that that wasn't I was surprised by, he is extremely high energy. Like okay. even even when the, he's not doing the act, like even when he's his normal self, his energy was like so high. I was trying to match it. And I was just was like, man, this guy, he can go hard in a good way. Like he's just. He's got some of the highest, probably the highest energy out of anybody I've ever talked to. Wow. Um, and not even in that act that he does on camera way. Yeah, that's interesting. I feel like, uh, you know, we talked about 
having your own moral compass. I would say his moral compass is very different than my moral compass, but I think it's very evident that he is very intelligent from a business and marketing standpoint, and he's leaned into that. And I don't think it's um, a surprise that his channel and he's doing as well as he is. Um, it's just a different approach than I would take, but teach their own. And that's why that's again, like I, I'm not condemning him. He's, he's been super nice to me. He's never been, I, and I've never had any issues with any of these guys, but it's a different style that may not work for everybody. And not everybody's going to be attracted to that. Um, at the same time, like the guys hustled his butt off. I, I met, I met him in 2013 in Canada at a meet when he was just this, rather unknown guy he was just a like i i thought i'm like this guy's a freak bencher bodybuilder guy but he was not big time at all and uh you know he figured it out like i can't hate on anybody for the hustle yeah and i think what's funny is you said he's putting on a on an act and i know people say he sounds like uh uh is a gilbert godfrey when he's putting his his act on and I think what's interesting is there's a video on Howard Stern of Gilbert Gottfried speaking, and he was putting on an act the whole time as well. He just sounds like a normal guy. And then the high pitch voice, I guess it worked. Yeah, Greg was, he was super fascinating. Like I, I thought he, learning about his actual life, I was like fascinated because he doesn't talk about that stuff. Um, so him as an individual, I was, I was super interested like getting to know him like it was really cool hearing his love for like cycling and stuff uh cool. but it's just it's not gonna be everybody's cup of tea for sure all right and the last one here is john hack oh yeah so john and i go back because when we were at the university of wisconsin um i was two years older than him or a year or something so we are pretty close in age three years apart i want to say i was like he was maybe a freshman or i don't know but we were going there at the same time and um, you know, he was this quiet kid. He was so quiet, but my buddy referred me to him. He's like, this guy's really strong. He's like a farm kid. He's uh, he's got some potential <laughs> and like, <laughs> got we, some potential. <laughs> yeah. We, we trained a fair bit for maybe a year and then I moved away. So that's what broke that up. Like okay. I moved away to Kentucky and that's when we stopped training, but we did train quite a bit up to about 2014. Um, we were training at Dan's gym in Madison. And so I, we, Dan got me a job as a bouncer and then I got John a job as a bouncer. So I worked there for three years. He worked there for like six. He was there for a while. He was loving it, but he's a, uh, I don't know. I never would have thought he'd be where he is now, but he's the picture of consistency. Um, he did things in a smart manner where he waited for the PEDs. He, mm -hmm. uh, his training was much more methodical than mine. I was like the reckless one who was just going to do whatever he felt like on a given day. John was much more calculated, much more methodical. He was going to stick to his program or whatever at that time. So it was, it was, polar opposites it was the guy on peds loose cannon gonna train how he feels no structure to the guy not on peds structured whatever um and obviously you've seen where that's gotten him so i never thought he'd be where he is now but it's crazy there's been a lot of strong lifters from wisconsin and he was he was definitely like he's the pinnacle of it something in the water yeah i don't know it's wild i mean we were all in that same area around Madison. It's where we kind of all were. It's crazy. Eric Bugenhagen. He was right from there too. I met him. Uh, I think similar to uh, Greg, you said when you met him, he was a very different person. Yeah, that was before he had blown up at all. Eric had maybe, he had somewhat of a YouTube following, but like an underground YouTube following, you know? And he was doing like circus lifts because that's always been what like got him on the map. Yeah. And, the first time I met him at the gym, he did a behind the back deadlift, like a hack deadlift with 725 pounds. I'd never met the guy because like Dan Paschalk, the gym owner, he's like, you got to see this guy here. And his whole niche, his whole niche was these behind the back deadlifts, which I'm like, what? why would you do a behind the back deadlift when you can just do it from the front? But 
that was his thing. And I even talked to him afterward. I was like, because I'd just seen this 725 pound behind the back then. I'm like, dude, what the heck is this? Like, he was a big guy. He was big. And he was natural at the time. So he was a big guy, even at that point. And I'm like, what in the world? I'm like, what do you deadlift normally? And he's like, he actually came up. He's like, I deadlift less from the front. And I couldn't even con my brain couldn't understand this. <laughs> He's like, I'm actually not great from the from a normal deadlift. I'm I'm just really good at these behind the backs. And I don't know. He started putting this stuff on YouTube. He would he started doing the crazy split squats and all this crazy stuff and uh the the wild act and all that. And he was a that's all again, it's an act, but he's a wild guy, no doubt. He loves it, he leans into it, and he does it in more of like a a, a friendly manner. He's not like stepping on toes with his content but yeah. um interesting guy for sure too i've actually only met him probably like once but he was right there too he lived in madison so again right in the same area so there's him there's john uh i'm trying to think i'm probably forgetting people it's just it's crazy but that area there was some some wild stuff going on yeah and, and eric's been on this podcast and oh, there's uh, <laughs> Totally appreciate him. He didn't have to. He's a big following, super nice guy. We had great offline conversation. I've nothing but good things to say about him based on my experience with him. Great energy. Um, yeah, hilarious. I'm not <laughs> surprised. I, I wish I had bumped into him more, but uh, I, I just, we were all busy, you know, living busy lives, I should say. And For a sure. lot of those guys started really like, coming around more right at the time I was leaving the city. So I was there for about four years in, in downtown Madison, that whole scene. And those guys started kind of bumping around more in 2013 ish. So we only had that one year overlap. And that's why I don't think I saw more of Eric and same with John. Like I would have been training with him for sure still, but we just went our separate ways in life. Cause that's how it goes. For sure. All right. I'm going to end today with kind of a fun question. So I think uh, Breaking Bad is one of the best shows from beginning to end. And yes, I'm curious, is there an episode or a scene from the show that sticks out to you? Because I know you're a fan. Yeah, I I haven't watched it in a few years, but I watched the whole the whole uh, whole show all seasons probably like four times. Like I from beginning to end four four times I've seen it, and it was probably the best show I've ever seen as far as how well it was made, all that sort of stuff. Cause it's just fascinating. Like I don't even have a standout moment, but the whole thing roped you in from beginning to end, especially the first three, the first three seasons were insanely good. And then it got, it started getting a little weirder at, at that point to come up with plot and stuff. But the first three seasons were just the best work you're ever going to see on TV. So, um, I don't know. Maybe I related to it too, because I'm like, Oh, I've kind of done sketchy underground <laughs> drug things. And then, uh, you know, they're doing that, but yeah. I don't have a standout moment. I would just say the first three seasons were significantly better. And those are the standout seasons. For me, it's when, uh, Hank opens up the book. Like oh he's yes. The toilet, and then he puts Dude. it all together. I, I think it was like a season finale. I remember I had goosebumps. Yeah. I'm like, Holy shit. Like no, that was it. Around. Okay, you're right. That was it. That's it. That's <laughs> I remember that. That was like the, like he has this epiphany of everything clicking with the uh, initials, and he's like, oh my gosh. "W W right or whatever." Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was, that crazy. was insane. And I feel like it's one of those shows where, like, if someone else was making it, they would have extended it another four seasons. But like, they're like, "No, we're gonna yeah. end it at the right time in the right way." And I was like, super satisfied with like the final season which i'm typically not with shows i agree i liked the ending we were all left wanting more but i think it was like season five or four or something where i was kind of like ah i wish it's kind of getting a little unhinged but I, I thought they roped it back in pretty well um i thought that was interesting awesome pete thanks so much for your time today appreciate it where can everyone find you yes sir uh Pete Rubish Fitness on YouTube because I have an old channel that's just Pete Rubish, but it's inactive. Uh, that's the main place. And then on Instagram, it's just Pete period Rubish. Awesome. Thanks for your time, man. I appreciate it. Yes, sir.